Good morning. Welcome. It is the Bible class of October the 3rd. Uh, Genesis 2. Fun. Yeah, let's, let's enjoy. Let's bow our heads first and ask the Lord and the Spirit to come for this look in the Word. Father above, thank you for your Holy Word. Thank you for your own Spirit. Stir him within us once more today that we might see and have you teach uh, what we need from you in your word. We ask that it would be filled with your law and gospel and that we would hear both what you expect of us but also how you have acted for our good in pure mercy. We ask that we would see uh, new things today, things that glorify you and that make and equip us for how we can manifest glory for you in the world as you use us and move us. Let us receive this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, um, Genesis 2. Yeah, pretty beginning stuff here. Um, it, you may recall uh, that we have just come out of Genesis 1. Imagine, it's a novel idea. I know. But what we have there, right from the very first verse of Scripture, is this description of God creating the heavens and the earth. Now, um, you hear it in the Nicene Creed, right? All things visible and invisible. This is the way the ancients understood reality. It's very coherent, very coherent, that those things that are of the heavens are invisible and those things that are of the earth are visible. And the big mystery, of course, is that all through Genesis 1, God was creating, he would, he would create space, and then he would fill it. Create the space, fill it with stuff. Whether that was heavens with, uh, you know, the birds of the heavens, or, or the earth with animals, and things like that. We saw him do this in both heavens and earth, creating and filling. And then, of course, the incredible part was that at the end of all of that, he created something in the center. All of it was for uh, mankind, and this this was this was an incredible thing that he what he did, he made one in his own image, right in the center of this whole creation in the heavens and the earth. He made in the center a unity of heaven and earth in this man. He took body from the earth, right? And his body was from, well, it was from the earth. And then he breathed breath. Uh, breath is invisible. Breath. He breathed that breath into the body. And, and what, what did you get? You got a unity of heaven and earth. You got Adam. Uh, he was uh, what, got, what the, the center of this whole creation. Now, this is, of course, I'm going to leave this open here. This is going to be pretty neat. I'm going to leave this open like this. Uh, and we'll, we'll maybe we'll come back to this. Maybe we'll come back. Let's see what, what happens here. Let's see. Um, we are told, of course, that God made them in his image, male and female, he created them. So maybe what I will do, I will do that here. Uh, but we're going to get male and female corresponding to heaven and earth um, in that sense, in the unity that, that they make. We're going we're gonna to talk about that. But first, let's let the Lord speak with his word, and we'll see that here, starting in verse 18. Then the Lord God said, now at this point that we're in Genesis 2, he's telling us about how he created humanity. Here it is. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. It is not good. How? Is it possible that after this good creation where God has made everything and seen that it is good, that it's actually something is not good? Why is it not good that the man should be alone? Is it just because he's going to be lonely? 
No. It's because on his own, when he's alone, he cannot create life. This is why it's not good. It's the end of creation. There's no more creating if that's if he's alone. That would be the end of life and that's not good. What does the man need? I will make a helper fit for him. Someone who's going to help him in this incredible thing of creating life. Remember, made in God's image, right? God is the one creating life in all of the creation account. And now Adam and Eve, well, the the man and the woman are going to be made to do that too. Wow. Right. So it's not good if he can't do that. He needs a helper and the helper needs to be fit for him. This is fantastic, by the way. Where's our, where's our image before? Um, uh, uh, Adam needs an earth to his, right? He needs, he, he, he needs uh, so, uh, the union of heaven and earth, of soul and body, of male and female, so that you get life. It's actually also so that you have knowledge. It's so that you know things. You only know them when you have this, this, uh, you've got purpose, right? Uniting with stuff. I like using that word because everybody thinks it's hilarious. It's stuff, it's just a bunch of stuff. Unless you have a name or you have an identity for that stuff, right? Then you know what that is. And that only happens, right? in that unity point and certainly that's the case with life so look at this we need things to fit it's kind of like puzzle pieces right you got two puzzle pieces and they better fit they have to fit in order for life to work in order for this to happen properly right Um, it has to work physically spiritually emotionally this is about complement, completion, right? This is going to complete God's purpose for mankind, made in his image, and the purpose is that you're going to have children. Children must be able to have children, right? So this is life. This is the purpose. This is the big thing. And this is, of course, what we heard in, in Genesis 1. Male and female, he made them. This is who human. this is what humanity is. Male, and female and they are made for one another so that in in a completing way it's complete one man one woman complete because then you have life and in fact in Genesis 1 right after he says he did that it says he blessed them he blessed them and told them why do you think he blessed them well you know why be fruitful multiply, fill the earth, right? We're still talking about life. That's what this is. That's, you get to participate in the big creation effort like me, like dad, right? It's amazing. Now, where does God look first? This is what's so curious. Look at this. He looks with the beasts and the birds. What? <laughs> Lord, I don't think you're going to find a perfect, suitable um, fit for Adam there. And in fact, no, he doesn't. Uh, But you see this incredible thing uh, where, uh, just in case you weren't, you didn't realize that God, um, let's go back to this here for a second. Just in case you didn't realize that God wanted humanity, Adam and Eve, to be participating in this action of creation. Look at this, where you, where you're breathing, purposing, naming, and identifying stuff so that it becomes something that can be known. It becomes real. Um, He does it with Adam right away. Look, he brought them to the man to see what he, Adam, would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. Why why do we get this description in Genesis here? This is really important. It, the reason is because Adam is given to participate in creation. He's the son of God, made in the image of God. And God brings Adam these nothings, these things that are not these identityless clumps. And he has Adam bring them into being. It is Adam who makes them what they are. It is Adam who creates the knowledge of, of uniting 
the, the stuff, the earth, with what he speaks the identity to be, right? The word that you're going to call that thing. That's when it becomes something. Otherwise, it's nothing. And this is an absolutely incredible part of reality. The same is true with our children. Parents are given to name their children. And so make them become who they are. We are continuing, even to this present day, to participate with God in creation. You see this? When you name your children, wow. Wow, do you realize what you're doing? Think of a baptism. You know how a baptism, we, uh, we always, that's actually the day, by the way, in the, in the ancient. You didn't name your kid, or at least you didn't tell your name, the name of the kid publicly until baptism day. Because there's this very specific moment where you say, how are you named? It's asked. Because at that moment, God's going to take the name of that, the newly named child and mix it, add his name to it, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? You're going to really identify that creation, super new creation right there. Um, all of that happened at once. And that's a beautiful thing because we're still participating in this. Now, another thing I, I, I'd use here to show you um, of this, this pattern that I, I show you on the back of here is look at this. Look at the different descriptions. The, we're told about the field and we're told about the heavens, right? Well, that's just the same thing again, right? That's the heavens are up here and the field is, is the earth, right? The field is down, um, not on the mountain, right? Down, down in the field, right? So we're just getting this description again. Um, we're showing that God, God brought every animal from everywhere, everything around Adam he brought to him, but he did not find what he was looking for, not around Adam. No, because he will need to take her from within. Take a look. So the Lord God caused deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last, because by the way, he's named a lot of animals. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Okay. Wow. God puts Adam into a deep sleep. Okay. Let's put his arms. He's, he's putting them under his head for a pillow, right? His little hands. And while he's in a deep sleep caused by the Lord God, he took one of his ribs out. Let's make it a long one. And made Eve out of that rib. Okay, right? And he closed up the spot. God did a little surgery. And brought, then, okay, let's stand him up again here. Here, he's over here now. There's Adam. And brought her to the man. Okay, um... Let's, let's be really, really clear about exactly what's happened here. This is really, really neat. The, the, the Hebrew word for earth, this is the word earth in Hebrew, Adama. Now, you remember how Adam was made. God took, God took um, earth that he had watered, and he took Adam out of the earth. See that? Adama. He takes the word Adam out of the Adama and makes him Adam. Now what has he done? He's taken the woman out of, what does it say here? She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So he's done it again. He's taken um, woman out of man, out of Adam. He takes the woman out of her, right? So this, this pattern is just continuing here. Uh, and it's, it's a beautiful pattern, especially when you realize, look at how far back this pattern has gone. It was heaven and earth, then it was Adam with a, with a breath and, and earth, and then it, he, out of that he takes the woman 
and you've got this unity of male and female, this complement where the pieces fit and life can be made. This is the this is the prime center. This is the one flesh what mystery of this whole thing. What is God doing? What is marriage? This is a great mystery. You, I mean, if you are not curious, if you are not absolutely perplexed. Then you're, then you're not paying attention because this is some really, really interesting stuff. There's a meaning behind this man-woman reality. This one flesh marriage. This, this unity that God intends. And, this, and by the way, at this point of, of, we're in Genesis 2, right? This is the most central, like we could draw, how many rings can we draw around this by this point? This is the most central moment of the entire creation account so far, right? Heaven and earth, body, soul, etc., etc. This marriage, this unity, is the one right smack dab in the middle. Why would God do it this way? The center of the whole plan. The most central thing. The way that life continues to be made with babies, right? Children. That's, that's a, that, you might think, well, that sounds like it. That must be it, right? Just babies, life, that's it. Be fruitful, multiply, and that's, that's all that there is. Well, it, this is, this is the Holy Scriptures. Let me, let me warn you. <laughs> God always has more. And the more significant thing than, than even than that is that this is the way in which God intends to unite himself to his children, his people, his bride. And we see that, I'm going to draw it up here. We see that in the crucifixion of Christ. When the new Adam, the second Adam comes, what happens? What happens is that God puts Jesus into a deep sleep. Remember how Jesus described sleep as death, right? Jesus is dead. And what happens? The soldier comes and with a spear pierces the side, the exact same flesh where the rib would have been. And what came out of that side? Blood and water. This is the font, right? This is the baptismal. This is what our baptismal font looks like. That's why I'm drawing it like this. Blood and water. Here. Our font looks like that. It's kind of sweet. And then had a baptism this morning, actually. Blood and water. That which God uses to make Christ's bride, the church. Water for the font to birth her and blood for the cup to purify and nourish her, uniting himself to her physically, spiritually, emotionally. Yes. This is the plan. It has always been the plan set out here before the fall in Genesis chapter two, fulfilled and instantiated for us on the cross, poured over our heads in baptism, placed into our mouths in the supper, in the here and now, where you are. Do you realize what we're doing? Do we recognize the incredible mystery that God is giving us to participate in by faith through these means of grace? Hardly. And yet they still work and they still grant and give us all the things we're growing. Lord, help us grow. Lord, we ask you, help us grow. Now, one last comment because we're in on this male and female marriage stuff. You can hear it in the gospel. So when you go now and you hear the gospel lesson, you're going to hear Jesus explain this is the reason that marriage is not to be broken. This is the reason it's not it's not because of some sort of regulation. It's because it would be separating heaven and earth. And those are not to be taken apart. Uh, when uh, your body and soul are separated, that's death. No, one man and one woman united in marriage is a mystery that declares eternal things God is doing. Your marriage does this, by the way. Whether you like it or not, think it's doing a good job of revealing that or not, that really doesn't matter. This is what marriage is. The two, heaven and earth, becoming one. Man and woman, what do we know about it? 
to becoming one. Let's receive it by faith. Let's let God give it to us and teach us what we are a part of. Lord, have mercy. And so, if I could leave with you um, the acknowledgement that you, in your marriage, or in your singleness, pursuing chastity and purity and and waiting on the Lord to bring you, just like Adam had to wait, uh, perhaps a spouse if that's his will for you, or not, you're pursuing the chastity and holding marriage up the way that Christ tells us it should be held up, that if you could understand today and believe this is what you've been called to, your marriage is a reflection and an expression of these mysteries, and that this is how you get to show the world grace and the union and, and this, the sacrifice and the love and the, and the connection and how heaven and earth and all these things are all are your own marriage. So understand your marriage differently. No longer scorekeeping, no longer as an umpire, a referee, but in grace, in understanding of this mystery and what it means for your faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your, what your purposes are and your mysteries are high. They're too high for us. Thank you for teaching. Thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for leading us slowly. And we ask that you would work mightily in our hearts by your own spirit. That we would acknowledge you have tied us to our spouses. You are the one uniting us together with them. And so we would not be, we would not pull against you in that, but would ask you in a renewed way this day and always to enter in and tighten the bond and display that unity to the world more and more. Knock out from every heart anything that would hold that back. Clean it with the blood of Jesus for us once more that every marriage uh, would be purified and again a reflection of all you're doing in Jesus for his sake of his church. Help us to wait patiently for you to reveal all this in its finality in the last day. And in the meantime, to be faithful at receiving what he gives out in word and sacrament. Lord, in your mercy, we pray. Amen. Okay, I hope that helps your understanding of Genesis 2, but also prepares you to hear the preaching today from Jesus. Have a great morning.